West Mitchell, Chris Clark here, GC Live Monday episode of the show. Got a lot to get to. Of course, we'll be talking about the exit of James Coley, I would say unceremoniously from South Carolina, heading on over to Georgia over the weekend. And what really ended up being part of a, a very busy weekend for South Carolina on the athletic front. You had both basketball teams in action, baseball team, of course, as that season gets rolling, and then some Kind of unsuspected football news. Didn't think we'd necessarily be talking about a coaching change in late February, but here we are, so we'll be talking about that as well. Chris, as always, brought by our good friend Clint Hammond of Movement Mortgage, clinthammond.com. I know 95% of you may not be in a position right now where you're trying to buy a home. All we ask is if you are in that position, give our guy Clint a chance to earn your business. Call him today, 803-771-6933. He's going to talk about that process with you with the added bonus of he's probably going to tell you how he feels about James Coley leaving yeah. as well. And, and like many Gamecocks, I'm actually I, I need to check on Clint. I've not received a text from him with his thoughts on this one. Normally, he's like, Wes, what's up with this, man? Why, why did this happen? How did this happen? And so I haven't gotten his response yet, but I imagine like many Gamecocks, not happy with the results of this weekend and as far as get James Coley heading back to Georgia, a place that he was at earlier in his career. Yeah, he was there uh, with Shane Beamer for a couple years, in fact. Uh, as we documented, Wes, there 2016-2017, Beamer leaves for Oklahoma to join Lincoln Riley's staff, and Coley was there a couple more years before he moved on to Texas A&M. Actually was demoted at Georgia from the OC position then left for a job at Texas A&M. But, Wes, along the way, whether it's at A&M, Georgia, FSU, Miami, you know, Coley got the reputation uh, that Shane Beamer talked about when he hired him, and that was a guy that's a good coach and a versatile offensive coach but has a reputation as a really, really good recruiter. And, you know, that's why Shane Beamer wanted to hire him to this staff in the offseason. It was largely seen as a, as a coup, right, as a really, really good hire for Beamer and hiring an, another guy with experience in that offensive room who's been an OC, who's coached multiple positions, developed guys, and obviously recruited a heck of a lot of guys. So, you know, th this stings, I think, for a lot of reasons. You've got the obvious, which is, hey, you've got spring practice coming up. Fortunately for South Carolina, spring practice is more than two weeks away. So from that standpoint, not a huge issue. But Coley was starting to get – entrenched in recruiting here at South Carolina, starting to get entrenched with the players. So that obviously hurts because you thought you had your guy, and now you don't. Now you're back at square one looking to hire a coach. And this isn't a coach that you just hired as part of a process, Wes, where you kind of have this open process and interview a bunch of guys and say, that was the best one. This is this was kind of a hand-picked guy for Shane Beamer this offseason that he knew he wanted to add to the staff if he could make it happen. You've got the obvious of that, the, the impact. But I think you've got a little bit extra on this one, kind of the personal aspect, kind of the, the loyalty aspect of this. Because, again, you've got two guys that have worked together. You've got Coley getting this job and then not leaving for like, oh, up out of nowhere he got a coordinator offer. Oh, out of nowhere he got a head coaching job or a, a chance to move to the NFL. No, in fact – going to one of South Carolina's what's been kind of one of their traditional rivals not long after he first took this job. And I think for this team and for Shane Beamer, probably personally, if I had to guess, you know, this one stings a little bit from that standpoint. Yeah. Let, let's call it for what it is, man. If I, if I'm Beamer, I'm pissed. Like this, this is a guy who is, like you said, a friend of mine. I get it. And I, I think, dude, I think it's even incredibly different if, Let's let's fast forward to next next December. So not even a full year, but a full football season. I think when when you hire a James Coley, you know there's going to be interest from other schools because he's got a reputation and he's got a resume. And you know, you you look that's one of the best resumes, really, frankly, of anybody South Carolina has hired in recent memory. If you sort of look at all the different places he's been. And he actually has stuck around. He's moved around, but he's stuck around. It's not been like one, one, one year, you know, at each spot. So 
I, I think when you hire a guy like that, Beamer mentioned there was competition to land him in the first place. South Carolina beat out a couple other schools to get him, and we're not talking about small schools. And so you felt like this was a, a good hire. And, and like you said, you made space. You you went out and got him. It wasn't like you had an opening and you said, oh, let's go. Coley would make sense. It was you thought highly enough of him to say, we're going to move Justin Step to tight ends. And then ultimately, Step made what he thought was the best decision for him and said, I don't, I don't want to coach tight ends. I'm going to go to Illinois to coach wide receivers because that's what I do. I'm a wide receivers coach. So I, I think for fans, this one stings a little bit extra because Step's a local guy. A lot of fans really like him. Some of them know him personally. And so it sort of pushed Step out. And then in the meantime, Coley – doesn't even give you one season. Like I, I think if he if he gave you a season and then something else popped up, he'd still get some flack from the fans. That that's part of it. But I think you could just say, look, it's business, man. Like this happens. Players leave after a year now. This is just kind of where it is. I, I think it stings the most in that there's a prior relationship here with he and Beamer. I'm sure he had started the process of getting to know your new wide receivers and telling them what the expectations are for them. And I'm sure the expectations are high. They're going through winter workouts right now. And it's, Hey, you've got to be dedicated to doing this, this, and this for the betterment of not just yourself, but this team and this program. Oh, by the way, guys, I'm, I'm leaving now. Enjoyed these three weeks. And I'm going to go to a team that weirdly, you don't play this coming year, but most years you would be playing. Yeah. <laughs> Best of luck. And that's something I don't know. Um, surprised we haven't been asked this more. Like what, how did the players find out? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know we saw a few of the ones that I remember, Wes, uh, DeBron Gatling, of course, true freshman, Maisie O'Bennett, other true freshman, Amari Huggins Bruce to transfer from Louisville, Dylan Native. I saw <clears throat> at least those three guys have a reaction on social media that was basically wow or or something like it, right? And so it, it is it is interesting. We we know that this is a business, right? This is something you and I talked about kind of behind the scenes when we first heard this. It is a business. And coaches know that, right? Like head coaches know when you hire a guy, that guy could leave. But this one, I think, goes a little bit beyond that, you know, and, and rightfully, I, I, I agree with you, rightfully so. You know, if Shane Beamer's TO'd about this, he's more than within his right, I think, to be TO'd. And so now where that leaves you is, you know, a lot of people have asked us, Wes, oh, well, well, Beamer can just go to his second option. Well, again, think back to this process, what we were just talking about. It's not like they had an opening and Beamer had this open, hey, we'll bring in, you know, three to five guys and interview them for this position. We've seen that in the past here at South Carolina, obviously, with Shane Beamer. But that was not the case. That was during the season, hey, Jimbo Fisher got fired. Oh, James Coley's on his staff. That means he's attainable and available. I would like to add him to my staff this offseason. Oh, and I would also like to slot him at the receiver position because mm -hmm. I need an up, you know, I need to upgrade, in my opinion, if I'm Shane Beamer, I need to upgrade the recruiting and the whole enchilada at that at that position. And so, you know, like you said, he moves step over, step ends up leaving, brings in Coley, Coley ends up leaving. So I I say all that to illustrate, you know, I don't I'm sure Shane Beamer has some ideas of guys in his head. But it's not like you just go back to your process that you were already going through. It's going to, in some ways, kind of start anew. So we'll see where it goes. I haven't, honestly, Wes, picked up any major traction as far as, hey, here's here's the guy or here's a few guys. So I think there's substantial mutual interest. But he'll be, I think, looking to check the same box as he was originally looking to check. And that guy, I don't know if he'll go younger or more experienced, but definitely strong recruiting. That's what he's going to be looking for. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Chris, I, I think you look at this and I, I like that 
with the podcast, we can maybe give the fans a, li- a little bit of kind of behind the scenes of how this generally plays out. And for us, a lot of times right when there's an opening and people rightfully so are going to say, hey, who, who might, where might they go? What's the direction? So now sometimes I think of Travian Robertson and, and that hire. Sometimes it's like, this guy makes sense. We know there's maybe been some interest in the past. It was weird timing when uh, when Jimmy left, when Jimmy Lindsay left. And you, you kind of just say, hey, th- this is an area we should go ahead and turn our attention to. But generally when there's an opening, we will first hear behind the scenes, hey, this guy is interested. That guy is interested. And then the most difficult part of the process is trying to find out okay, where is the mutual interest? Where has Shane Beamer's attention turned in terms of making a a hire? Sometimes it also is, all right, there's a head coach involved, but is there an offensive coordinator that's maybe more or less involved in in this decision? So early on, I know fans want names, and if I was just a fan, that's what I'd be saying. Hey, who are we hiring? What's the deal? I get that. It is sometimes a little bit slower in – kind of figuring out exactly where the people making the hire may be leaning. Sometimes it's one of those first guys you hear. It's, well, they're interested, and they sort of push into the mix and are impressive, and and boom, there it is. Other times it ends up being somebody completely different, and a lot of times there's maybe some prior relationship where – there's just something none of us have even been told at the time, or maybe there's a coach that has told Shane Beamer two years ago, hey, man, if you ever got an opening, I'd love to be on staff. And Beamer's just filed that away in the back of his mind. And I, I, I tend to think it's too early to know. Like you said, do you go young up-and-comer? Do you go experienced veteran? It could go many different ways. Ultimately, I still think, you're just trying to make the best hire, whichever one of those it is. Yeah, you'll, you'll just make the move. I do tend to think coaches and just people in general, Chris, are a little bit more just human nature-wise likely to maybe go against the grain of what they just got burned on. And, and what I mean by that is at some point, you look at the continuity they have on defense – and the lack of continuity on the offensive side right now, I mean, you're talking about the tight ends having, what, three different coaches in a short span, and you're talking about the wide receivers who will now have had three different coaches in a short span. You're going to want, like you said earlier on the radio, you can't just hire all they want to be here. (laughs) Yeah. But, among your pool of guys, if you have a pool of five people and you're like, I think all five of these guys could get the job done. Do you give a little extra bump up the list to the person who sees this job as somewhere they want to be and sees this job as something to be grateful for and thankful for, not as, oh, that's not a blue blood I, I think with Coley, there was a little – you remember a lot of the guys on the Muschamp staff, there was a little bit of that. There's little rumblings about, ah, oh, this is not this is not Florida or this is not Georgia. Mm-hmm. I, I think with Coley, there was a little bit of that. And yeah, yeah. look at the evidence, too. He, he left the second he got a chance to go back to a blue blood. So uh, do, do you kind of – ease towards a guy who's going to be like, this is an SEC school, it pays well, beautiful f- facilities, a good recruiting area. I can win there. I can be successful there as opposed to the hired guy who's just like been at a bunch of blue bloods and maybe is going to take the first job that they get after this. So l- let me answer it two ways. If it's me – answering your question of do I lend a little bit more credence to if if things are relatively equal yes I do now let me answer it and for what my opinion on Shane Beamer is absolutely I think you could kind of look at how he operates his program 
you know, this has kind of been one of those narratives of I ah, doesn't go after big name coaches, right? Well, number one, I I would disagree with that in some ways because like Torian Gray was a big name, right? Been VT, been at Florida, like he's a really good, accomplished DB coach. Um, you know, Pete Limbo, you know, that was a big name, yeah, special teams coordinator, but right, you saw how that turned out, right? Um, he kept Mike Bobo initially. That was on his first stop. That's a, you know, you may not think, oh, I don't think Mike Bobo did a great, good job. Okay. But he's more along the lines of one of the, like a Georgia guy, a blue blood type of coach. And then he's had a mix of guys where you, maybe fans hear the name at first and they go, who was that? You know, he's had some of both of those this off season. I think it just so happened to work out that he did hire some bigger names. I don't really think that was intentional because Shane Beamer has said publicly many times, I'm not worried about hiring a name. But I do think one of the things he looked at is, let's add some experience. So he he hires Joe D. Camillus, who in special team circles is a huge name, 30 years experience. Markwell Blackwell, you know, maybe to the common casual college football fan, you say the name Markwell Blackwell and get, who is that? But he's been at multiple SEC programs and coached some really good SEC backs. James Coley, same deal, right? And so I, I think he went in that direction, not, hey, let me go Google some names that college football fans know. But he it ended up working out that way. So I think when you look at this new hire – I think he's just going to be looking more at characteristics and, and recruiting is going to be a big one. That can be an older guy. That could be a younger guy, you know? Like, I think Gamecock fans aren't going to hear this, man, but like when Dabo Swinney promoted Jeff Scott, Jeff played at Clemson. He was a GA there. He was the wide receivers coach at Presbyterian College. Jeff Scott's one of the best wide receiver recruiters we have seen in college football in the modern era, for sure, uh -huh. maybe in history. Like, he was really good at it. When he got the job, didn't have a lot of experience and wanted to be there, right? So that that does count for something. So I think Shane Beamer is going to have some characteristics he looks for. But I do think, looking back at some of the situations that have happened, Mike Bobo, Will Friend, James Coley, having the potential for stability and longevity is something he's going to look at more than just, Hey, th this guy's got a really, really good resume. If I just plug him in, that'll fix the problem. I, I think it's going to be much more than that. Yeah, and I, I think you, you you don't want to be in a situation where your receivers have yet another guy coming in like that. That that group, it, and you know, it's a new group for the most part. But they uh, they have been through a lot at, at this point in terms of carry you know changeover, I should say. And you know, we'll see what direction this goes. Couple of guys mentioning uh, Coach Pete. What's up, man? Um, Travis Edwards mentioned Jason Barnes. I, you know, I, and I think Jason, uh, you know, JB is a riser in the college coaching world. And you know, I, I think if you're going to go young, if you're going to go South Carolina connections, if you're going to, and, and I'm not saying this, it, it's not a risk in, in terms of who he is as a coach, but in terms of a little bit more inexperienced guy, then I think the two obvious names are like a Jason Barnes and a Perry Parks. And so those are names that are going to pop up, I think, here locally that, that do make sense. And it makes sense to have a conversation there if you're Shane Beamer. It's just a matter of, you know, do you think JB is is ready for, for that role, for SEC wide receivers coach? And I think would certainly recruit very well just in terms of connecting with guys. And so, you know, th those are two guys I don't want to say you keep an eye on yet because, again, we're still trying to figure out that piece from from the Beamer side of it. But from from an interest standpoint, yeah, you can keep an eye on those two guys and, and just sort of um, follow them away. There are some other names that will pop up, I'm sure. Some other names are already kind of quietly tracking that we're not sure yet if they have that traction that you would be looking for in terms of actual ones to watch. 
Beamer tends, Chris, I feel like, to operate fairly quietly in this stuff. Now, we, we've been, I don't want to say lucky, we've been fortunate at times to still be able to get a good handle on it. And there's been other times where we've just had to say, look, it's been, it's been quiet on, on this front. There's been other times where, you know, Markwell Blackwell, we actually heard that name. <laughs> we didn't think it had quite as much traction. And then we were kicking ourselves for not putting it out there because it ended up having not only traction, but but being the higher. So so these things play out a little bit differently each time, right? And it'll be obviously fascinating to see which way they go. And I, I don't think you have to – you don't have to make a hire by Tuesday afternoon. Like this is not one of those. But you're obviously with spring practice kind of starting to be around the corner. You're not just going to sit on your hands and – and hang out either. This this is probably, I dare say, something Beamer. I imagine he's been on the phone, safe bet today, um, vetting people. Yeah, that that's a piece that I don't have a ton of detail on yet, Wes, of just where he's at in this process. Um, I know, you know, the the day of the day and in, in, in the hours the day after this Coley thing happened, there had not been any you know, official conversations yet. And that's not that surprising. You know, there's generally a progression to these things to where unless a coach just has somebody like, oh, I'm going to promote that guy, right? Which I don't, that's not going to be the case here. I don't think, you know, there's a process to it. And the early stages of that process are normally a bunch of coaches reaching out <laughs> to the head coach or agents reaching out to the head coach or the head coach's agent saying, hey, I would, I would like to get in on that job. And then from there, the board's narrowed and then some conversations take place. So don't know if those have happened yet. I think they probably will this week, Wes, if I had to take a stab at it, probably early this week. And like you said, Beamer, you know, vetting candidates through various research channels. So I, I'm fascinated to see which direction it's going to go. I really don't have a great sense right now as to what direction that may be. How about speaking of directions, I – I thought, hey, maybe if you're South Carolina, do you call Josh Crawford, who was widely considered, I don't know if you say he was the favorite, but was considered a heavy factor in the Georgia receiver opening, and then they hired Coley instead. And I'm like, well, hey, if you're South Carolina, do you do you reach out to Crawford and see if there's interest there? And then what does Georgia do? They turn around and they hire him to be their running backs, running backs coach, a spot that really most of his career has been more focused on receivers. And interestingly enough, Chris, Jimmy Smith, the Arkansas running backs coach, who has heavy ties to Atlanta and is from the Palmetto State, his name was being sort of bounced around by Georgia media folks as well. So it seems like there was some carryover in these two hires, but ultimately, obviously, South Carolina went a different direction, and then Georgia did as well. It sounds like Crawford, just from what I've read, maybe was so impressive that they said, hey, we like this guy enough to just bring him in and slide him over to running backs. Yeah, let's let's add this guy to the staff. That was surprising when I saw that. And um I, I did go I gotta admit something, Wes. I went back and looked and and looked at the resume. Did Jimmy Smith coach receivers at any point in his career? He did not. He's <laughs> running backs OC at the high school level, coach quarterbacks at the high school level. So that's that's kind of a stretch, right, to think that he may be involved with a receiver's job at South Carolina. I don't think that would happen. Um, I think it would have been the running back's coach job, if anything. So that was an interesting move um, for sure. And so that kind of – that takes him – if that would have been a consideration on Josh Crawford, mm -hmm. certainly taken off the board now. Yeah, and, and no indications that even he would have been. It just sort of – it was a name that I, I think fans had sort of connected the dots on and just said, hey, well, George is talking to him. Maybe maybe South Carolina will as well. He's obviously in the same recruiting territories and would be an intriguing hire. All right, before we move any further, let me tell you about our friend Andy Ludicky with My Perfect Franchise and MyPerfectFranchise.net. You can call Andy today, 404-973-9901, or shoot him an email – Andy at myperfectfranchise.net. 
uh, you may be saying, well, what, what does that actually mean? And so what Andy does is he is a franchise consultant, which means he is going to take franchise that are, that are looking for new owners, and he's going to link them up with people who are looking to get into the business ownership game. And uh, essentially, he's going to sit down with you. He's going to talk to you about your skill set, your financial requirements, how much time you have to commit. And then he's going to match you up with the franchises that are looking for those same exact things. So if you wanted to maybe just add a side job, maybe you want to completely get out of whatever business you're in right now, diversify, build wealth, leave a legacy. If any of those things sound intriguing to you, Andy will talk to you and his services are 100% free. He is here to help if you have any questions about business ownership. Again, 404-973-9901 or Andy at MyPerfectFranchise.net. Big shout out to Andy for being a supporter of both our show as well as shows throughout the Own3 network. Uh, give him a call today, 404-973-9901. Other than South Carolina losing football coaches, Chris, a very successful weekend for the Gamecocks, I thought, as far as the quote-unquote major sports, both basketball teams getting wins. Women's basketball team, of course, expected to win, but they took care of business. And the men's basketball team getting back on track with a win at Ole Miss that puts them, I would say, borderline lock status for the NCAA tournament, certainly if the tournament started today, easily in. When I say borderline lock, I mean to where literally like they are a lock. No matter what happens next, we'll see if that ends up being the case. But just to bounce back, let's start right there. Bouncing back on the road. SEC road wins, man, never easy to come by. And this was one that they went and they didn't have to really grind it out or, uh, you know, make a bunch of plays late. They just went in there, I thought, and almost felt like a business trip. They did what they were supposed to do. and. Just a, another impressive bounce back for a team that had to face a little bit of adversity after losing two last week. Yeah, I thought they played their game and um, really controlled it with maybe a couple pockets in there, Wes, almost from start to finish. I mean, you looked up, it's not like it was a 30-point blowout, but you would look up and South Carolina would be up, you know, 10, 11 points, and you're like, man, they just seem like they're so in control took great care of the basketball, shot well, took really good shots, shared the ball. You know, I think we saw some things in that game that illustrate that if South Carolina is playing its game and hitting its shots, they, they are incredibly tough to beat. Um, and one of those was just B.J. Mack hitting from the outside, right? He got several open shots, knocked them down. When that's happening – I mean, it's a tough ask for anybody because they're, they're going to be most games, pr almost every game, they're going to be South Carolina is really consistent in the area where it's easiest to be most consistent. That's defense, right? Some nights your shot's not going to fall, but they're going to play really good defense. Um, I thought they, you know, after a two game skid where sometimes they got out of their identity a little bit and maybe the opponent, particularly like in the Auburn game, just kind of took them out of what they do. Didn't happen at all. And, you know, from start to finish, they just got great efforts really from everyone. I think I thought everybody who played gave South Carolina exactly what they needed in that game, whether that was outside shooting, making the right pass, playing great team defense. I thought they were able to do it. And so that was a big win, right? Because this team, when they've been challenged, they've typically risen to the occasion. And that was kind of the next step. Hey, now you got a two-game skid. Can you go rebound and not suffer a, another tough loss on the road? And that's exactly what they did. Yeah, and I, I don't know about you, man, but I, I was looking at it. You don't panic over a two-game skid, but the, the part of it that I think probably should have concerned South Carolina fans was that you lost a very winnable game at home against LSU in a game that you were kind of in control of. And then you start looking at the schedule and what was left, and you're saying, it's not just that you lost a couple of games. That can happen to anybody in this league. It's more, what do you have next? And you have some teams that are tough to beat anywhere that you're playing at home. And then you have some road games where you're saying, Ole Miss on the road is just kind of a different story. On the road for you is kind of a different story than 
the friendly confines of, of them coming into Columbia. Anytime a team has to travel a, a decent amount, uh, I think that affects their legs and their shooting ability. And so you're just kind of looking at it, you're saying, you don't want to let this thing get away and blow what you, by your own doing, have created this just great opportunity for yourself. So whenever you have those opportunities, and I'm talking about obviously making the tournament, potentially improving your seed on, along the way, you don't want to take those for granted and and blow what was an opportunity that most people didn't even think you were going to have when this season started. So uh, just to to go ahead, to get another win, to sort of put yourself in position to not even really have much pressure the rest of the way, you know, I, I think for one, it's just very impressive. Like you got to just keep giving them credit. Two, you look at A&M coming up and, you know, South, South Carolina actually, according to, again, the ESPN matchup predictor, which hates Carolina in the analytics for some reason. Carolina's not favored in this one either, but they've beaten the computer just consistently this year. Just time after time have beaten the computer metrics. So I don't put much stock into that. They're 22-5 and five right now, 10-4 and four in conference. They're probably a lock regardless, but I, I think if you win – Against A and M, you're sitting there 23 and five, Chris, 11 and four in SEC play. Then no matter what happens, I, I think you're in. I think you're literally playing for seeding. They may already be at that point, but I think to just completely lock it up, win this week, and then you're just you're playing for seeding and for for confidence and for momentum and all those other things that that you've earned. Yeah, you, you'd certainly feel much better about it, right? If you could just go win this weekend again, and then you're a little bit more on the on the house money side of things. What what are the what's the percentages, Wes, on there? Yeah, well, so all right, they've got they've got A and M on Wednesday, and yeah. so it's you, you know I I always preach don't get mad at it, guys. It's just a stupid computer. Yeah, but well, it's hard. 72.6% AM went. Now that thing puts a ton of stock into home or away. From what I from what I can tell. I, I don't know what all goes into it, but it just seems anecdotally to put a ton because you look at Florida, they're number 24 right now in the polls. They're like 30, 31 in the net. They're a better team than AM by most indicators. And that one is 51.8. Florida has the advantage, but it's 51.8 to 48.2. So by all intents and purposes, it is a coin flip of a game. And so I, I do think there is quite a bit of um, home versus away factored into whatever their, their algorithm is. Craig says we aren't favored in any of the last four. Yeah, but, I mean, South Carolina wasn't favored against Ole Miss either. And they went out there and just, I thought, dominated that game. So I, I don't I don't put a ton of stock into the metrics. I think Tennessee, even though it's at home, will be tough to win. Anytime you go on the road, you know, AM can beat you, but you can beat them too. And just the way this team has played, yeah, they've had a couple of every team, every team has setbacks where they let one get away. Yeah. But for the most part, this team just shows up and and they just come to the come to the arena and, and do their thing. And I, I think that's that's to be commended. Like um, like this poster says, they're, they're almost all quad ones right now. And depending on a couple little things, at one point they were all quad ones. Florida literally went from 30 to 31. So that's a quad two. Ole Miss within a 48-hour period, that's been a quad one game a quad two game, and then back to a quad one game. So either way, you're playing games that are going to help your your net. South Carolina now currently sitting at 48 in, in that. And so I think you have an opportunity with these opponents if you can win some more of these games. Don't you think you probably dramatically could improve your seeding because yeah. I think you could dramatically improve your net with a couple more wins against these teams that the computers love. Yeah, I mean, you start 
you can start. Are we at the dreaming phase, Wes, where Gamecock fans can start thinking about, okay, man, you know, not just not just get into the tournament, right? But how how high can you push this potential seed? And it's not far fetched to think that South Carolina could win not just one game, two games. Like you can't look at the schedule and say, ah, uh, only two of those four are winnable. Only three. No, they've beaten Tennessee on the road. So yeah. I, I think it'll be tough too. It's gonna be hard to beat a team that's as good as Tennessee twice. Like A and M beat them earlier in the season too, at home, and then got destroyed on the ro- on the road. So that's different. Carolina obviously gets them at home, but I think you could start thinking about ending the season and then getting the SEC tournament play. This thing could go up, man. I mean, it really could. But A and M's a hard team to figure out because they've been so up and down. Yeah, they they have been, man. So we'll see. We, uh, for the most part, would leave the basketball, you know, breaking down that stuff to the other guys. But worth mentioning, just big picture standpoint, how how impressive this has been. And, yeah, I see some talk in the comments. South Carolina a still officially a, was a seven seed when they updated everything on Friday. But then I, I saw on ESPN this weekend the sort of live updates on the brackets. They were a six seed from Lenardi at that point. So I would expect them to be a six when he does his updates on Tuesday. They've been putting those out. At least ESPN has. They've been putting those out on Tuesday and Friday. So would expect South Carolina to be a six seed then when that comes out. And that's a, it's a great place to be right now with a chance to potentially move up even more. Like I said, women's basketball, just a dominant win over Kentucky you know the the team Chris had not played that great lately I feel like you could tell they were a little worn down maybe it's just a long season and so they locked up the SEC championship this past or on Sunday they locked up the you know outright SEC championship if you will and also just I, I thought that's one of the best games they have played this year in terms of you look at the box score, six different ladies with double-digit points and then a seventh with nine points. Like, you want to talk about balance. That That is insane how just completely balanced and top to bottom, entire lineup played pretty well, I thought. And the other thing that just struck me is how far off Kentucky women's basketball has fallen. Like, this is a team – they beat South Carolina in the SEC tournament. Was that two years ago? Three years ago. Might have been three, yeah. yeah. They, they put up the graphic the other day after after one of South Carolina's re- – like during the game, and it was like past SEC tournament champions. South Carolina, blah, 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 Kentucky, blah, blah, blah. and then it just like Kentucky was one of the last, you know, 100 or so. Not really, but, man, I mean, they just – yeah, they got them that one year. After Matthew Mitchell left, you remember that coach they had? Mm-hmm. Seems like it just kind of whoop went down. Yeah, they they've fallen off, man. So I I think for them, I don't know. It's just baffling how far off. I think South Carolina just smashed them the first time at home, and then uh, goes into their place and just hammers them top to bottom. I felt like. They were looking for for that hundred spot too, Chris. Like it felt like they 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 knew the score. I would say so for sure. I mean, they they were relentless and um they got off to a little bit of a better start. Then they were super balanced. You know, Pow Pow got hot again. What she have like three threes in a row at one point during the game. Again, they're doing all this. I don't think we've even mentioned this. They do this again without Cardoso, which just shows the depth and the quality of this team. And I think we've seen this team just continue to grow. And I think, Wes, even in the moments where they've had some close calls or some struggles, or you look up and they're playing a Georgia team that's just not very good at home, and it's a close game. In in the second half of that game, you're going, wow, what is going on here? I think – Don Staley and and this team, to their credit, 
have been able to use those moments as, you know, you still get a win, but you try to grow from them. And and I do think, look, there's been some fatigue. There's no doubt. There's been some ruts. And a lot of teams, they would have dropped one of those games or two of those games or three of those games at some point. And you'd still be sitting here talking about maybe the best team in the country, right? I think the difference is this team – They've had some of those moments, but instead of losing, they've just kept winning. And then when they, you know, were able to achieve like like the Kentucky game was kind of what you envision as the peak version of this team, right? They just they're doing almost everything right. We saw that again this weekend. For sure. All right, before we get out of here, let us tell you about our friends at Liberty Tax. Obviously, tax season is upon us. You're going to want, first of all, to support some Gamecocks, if that matters to you as well. But you're going to want somebody who's got a ton of experience and can help you get every tax break you could possibly find. That's our friends at Liberty Tax with three convenient locations throughout the Columbia area. Call them today, 803-462-5576. Larry and his entire team, they're committed to helping you kind of get through a process that none of us love but is a fact of life. And you want to, again, get every rebate you could possibly get. They want to help you do just that. And you know what? They'll talk some Gamecock football with you while they're at it. 803-462-5576. That's our friends at Liberty Tax right here in the Columbia area. Chris, two out of three for the baseball team over the weekend. Ugly game on Saturday, but did what they were supposed to do on Friday and Sunday. And most everybody at this point, I think Tyler Head was saying there's like three teams still undefeated in the SEC. Every team's got a blemish on their record. Season about what you thought it would maybe be so far, and they've got one midweek, and then Clemson Tigers. We really – I mean, this – every year, the way the schedule has set up here in recent memory, for both of those schools, you get your early indicator, your early sort of barometer of where you're at, and that'll be taking place this coming weekend for South Carolina and for Clemson. Yeah, and Gamecocks dropped – they dropped game one of that, right? That series at Clemson last year. And then, of course, ended up coming from behind uh, in the neutral site game and then winning in Columbia. Somebody correct me if that's wrong. That's the way I remember it. But it is a good early barometer. And certainly, look, you go back to the series this weekend, the way that I kind of thought of it was Saturday was kind of an aberration. Like, nothing went right. You were basically over with runners in scoring position. You committed several errors. It just wasn't pretty. But then you kind of look at it and you go, okay, well, you know, you repeat that on Sunday and you've lost a series to Belmont at home. And I, you know, I'm not going to pretend to know how good Belmont's supposed to be, Wes. I have no idea. Um, but what I do know is if you're South Carolina, if you're Mark Kingston in this year, that's a series you need to win out of the conference at home. And so, they came back on Sunday, dominated. They hit for power. They got timely hits. The pitching uh, was very good. Uh, Roman Kimball, first inning, you know, had a little bit of control issues, but quickly dialed that in. Gave him, I think, 65 pitches. Becker came in, did a great job as well. Is exactly what you needed, and now you've rebounded and gotten yourself into good position. And I think we saw some positives out of the pitching staff overall, Wes, during the weekend. And I think you're maybe getting some of your better guys on track. We saw, you know, Saturday the wind kept probably a few home runs still in the park. But Cassis swung the bat well. We saw Cole Messina swing the bat very well. Ethan Petrie, three for four on Sunday. So that may be an encouraging sign going forward. No doubt we'll all be tuned in and watching this weekend, South Carolina versus Clemson. First, got to get through the midweek. Can't overlook that. But uh, it will be a fun weekend for sure and a, a big weekend throughout South Carolina Athletics. Uh, obviously, like we said, A&M for men's basketball in the midweek, but there will be a big home basketball game against Florida as well for the men. So, all right, y'all, that's going to do it for today's show. Be on the lookout for more shows throughout the week. And we, we promised this before, Chris. I think it's a good time to maybe effort getting Charles Power on. So, I know they just – on three is just putting out their – 2025 rankings updates. So if you're into the recruiting ranking stuff, go check that out. I think some of the in-state guys have just gotten rankings that we were kind of waiting on. Anthony Addison being one of them, the edge target for South Carolina from Sumter. 
So go check those out. Mike, I believe, will be back on tomorrow. Uh, there will, of course, be some hard foul episodes where uh, Jack and Joe will probably look into some basketball and some baseball as well. So, all right, for Chris, I'm Wes. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Appreciate all of our sponsors, as always. And y'all have a great day.